Okay. Uh, oh, we didn't give them. Did you type in the clicker number? No, it had one on there. I thought you typed it in. Okay, can't go back and reassign. Okay. Start new session. Okay, that's right. Isn't it? I could have just done that. Mm hmm. Yeah, type this number in. Okay, I thought you did that. Yeah, no, I didn't. Okay, ooh, we're recording that. Uh, okay, students, sorry, we're fussing with stuff up here. Let's go. Uh, a couple things I want to mention before we get down to the uh, nitty gritty of analyzing starlight, and that is just to remind you, we have an exam on Tuesday next week, normal exam procedures apply. And so that means special seating uh, procedures. Uh, front row, uh, we're going to have assigned seating up in the front row, and, and then you're going to assign yourself seats, you know, the first uh, 10 rows or whatever it is. Um, no cell phones, and definitely uh, be prepared to think. Now, we're going to talk about the main thing, the, the unifying uh, concept for exam four uh, today, and we actually talked about it last time. It's the HR diagram, the color luminosity chart. Now, uh, in section 18.4 on the color luminosity chart, HR diagram, uh, they have a nifty table. Nobody's looking. I see a lot of you guys looking at your phones. Look up here. We got a table. Come on. We got, a, we got stuff to talk about. Good. All right. Uh, nifty table. Uh, and it basically goes through the characteristics of a star that we can either measure or calculate from a measurement or a set of measurements. So um, and it's, it's good to just review um, from this because all this stuff is actually encoded in the HR diagram. For instance, surface temperature. That's on the horizontal scale of the HR diagram and we know how to do that. You, know, you either figure out the peak wavelength or maybe you examine the spectrum and compute uh, the spectral type or the color index. Uh, so this first one, yeah, we know how to do that. Uh, chemical composition, yeah, we know how to analyze that basically. Remember the first day we looked at three different chemical elements. We looked at hydrogen, helium, and neon. Uh, and the key word there is quantum fingerprints. The quantum fingerprint of hydrogen is uh, the Balmer series, specifically beautiful red H alpha, and then the aqua tealish uh, H beta, and so on. And the spectral lines are like the um, quantum fingerprints. So that's how you figure out the chemical composition of a star, at least the outer layers. Luminosity, we know how to do that. You got to get a parallax distance of some kind, and then you, you say to yourself, okay, if it looks like it's uh, one watt and it's 1.5 uh, light years away, then how, how dim would it be at, uh, you know, 33 uh, light years away, 10 parsecs? All right, so you, you figure that out using, um, you know, kind of like what we did the other day. Uh, radial velocity. Radial velocity, just to remind you, is the velocity, the component of a star's velocity that's either receding from you, that's a positive radial velocity, or coming towards you, that's a negative radial velocity. All right, now, a star can also be kind of slanting across your point of view. That's known as a transverse velocity. Doppler shift doesn't give you that. Uh, but the Doppler shift will tell you to the degree that it's receding or to the degree that it's approaching. Yeah, you can get an idea of that. Question? Uh, yeah, the question is, if you can't find a radial Doppler shift, a blue shift or a red shift, uh, can you assume that it's transverse only? And yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You know, then you get, but then what you have to do then is you have to wait for it to, if it's only got transverse velocity, that means it's going to inch across the sky sideways, you know, or, you know, top to bottom or something, you know, whatever direction it's moving. And that sometimes takes time to, you know, like years or, you know, decades even. But yeah, theoretically, you could do that. Another thing that we know from Doppler shift 
is rotation. We're going to spend a few minutes on rotation today um, to reinforce this one. Uh, mass, yeah, the mass of a star. This is the star's DNA. Um, and yeah, we know all about that. That was before exam X, Kepler's third law. You know, we figure out the orbital period. And with that, the orbital period and semi-major axis, we can also get this, the mass of each star in a binary star system. Diameter, this one's a little trickier. Um, and we didn't really go into this, uh, but this first one, number one, measure the way a star's light is blocked by the moon. What that really means is, if you're looking at a star and the moon passes in front of the star, it'll black out the star. And then as the, as the moon goes across, it will reveal the star again on the other side of the moon. All right. And that is a process called occultation. And go ahead and jot it down. O-U-C-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-O-N. Now, it's nothing to do about, you know, you know like scary uh, vampires or occult or anything. What it means, it's from the Latin word hidden. Occult means hidden. And the star becomes hidden by the moon. Now, the advantage that the moon has is that it has no atmosphere. It's so small, so rocky, there's no atmosphere. And that means that either the, the, the light goes past the moon or the light gets blocked by the moon. You know, like in our atmosphere, we have a very thick atmosphere. We can, technically, we can see the sun um, a little bit before it's, or after it crosses the horizon because the light bends through our atmosphere a little bit, refraction. The sun doesn't do that. And what the sun, excuse me, the moon doesn't do that. So when a star goes behind the, the moon, uh, what happens is diffraction. And just like uh, we use diffraction gratings, we set up diffraction gratings to break apart light. Uh, the moon will do the same thing with a single edge. You know, the ones that we looked at on the first day of class had zillions of little openings parallel, and they cause the light to fracture, to diffract into the various colors. Uh, the moon will do that as well. Uh, and so uh, measuring the diffraction pattern of a star allows us actually, it's kind of difficult to do, there's a ton of calculus in it, but you can figure out the diameter of the star based on the diffraction pattern that you pick up in occultation. And I've made that um, calculation and I've made that observation in, in uh, you know, at a big telescope on a mountaintop out west. So it's, you know, something uh, astronomers like to do. Measuring the light curves and the Doppler shifts. Yeah, if you can see how fast something dips in intensity, you know, when another star goes in front of it and how deep it dips and then how high it rises again and how quickly it gets back to 100% transmission. Uh, yeah, you can make decisions based on that about the width uh, of the star. So diameter, all this stuff we can figure out if we can get a few strategic calculations. And the biggest one is getting a parallax distance. That's, if you can get that, boy, you can build on that and, and get a lot of this other stuff. Now, I want to go through this concept of rotation all right, and, uh, and how you use a Doppler shift um, to uh, measure the rotation. Now, what we've done is take a look at the sun, but with stars outside the solar system, it's a little bit different. And it has to do with the line, the spectral line width. So make a note, spectral line width and rotation. And last Thursday, we talked about this Doppler gram of the SUN. And we said, yeah, you can see some, um, the sun coming toward us on the, on, the, uh, on the left side and away from us on the right side. So we know the sense of rotation of the SUN. Now, the problem with that uh, is that, okay, it works out nicely. You know, we can, we can aim our scanner at the left side of the sun and then move it in, you know, by a degree and, and get, you know, and map out the Doppler shift all the way across the sun, all the way to the right side. And you could do it top to bottom. 
You know, map out the Doppler shift top to bottom. But for a star, you can't do that. So here's the kicker. If you're looking at a star, it is so small, it looks like a point source of light. So you can't aim your scanner at point A and then re-aim it a little bit different direction to point B. It won't work out that way. Okay. Uh, so how do you handle it? Well, here's uh, a note from chapter 17.4. And we're going to spend a few minutes here with figure six. Uh, stars, however, as I mentioned, are so far away that they all appear as unresolved points. In physics, we would call it a point source. The best that we can do is to analyze, analyze the light from the entire star at once. All right. So what that means is when you look at a star and you see an absorption line like right here. Let me get my cursor over here. Okay, now here, see where my cursor is. That's an absorption line and that's kind of, mm, that's in the greens. So I don't know, that might be magnesium or, or a calcium line or something like that. Okay, when you see that absorption line, you know that there's calcium and you know the way, and you can compute the wavelength and stuff. If it's in motion, you're gonna see the line broaden. The line gets wider. And the reason for that, you're seeing some green and then also from the side that's moving away from you, you're seeing some uh, yellow, yellowy green. And then from the side of the sun or the side of the star coming towards you, you're seeing some bluish green. All right, now those are the Doppler shifts and they're all rolled into one. And so the, the, the um, absorption line is gonna be a little bit wider. It's gonna be an absorption, uh, you know, uh, whatever this is, magnesium, is gonna absorb a little bit of that bluish green, a little bit of the green and a little bit of the yellowish green. And therefore it's gonna look wider. Now this one over here on this side, um, this one is the, is the uh, hypothetical star that's not rotating. So there's no Doppler shift from this one. And you get a nice, tight, close absorption line here. So here's another pull quote from 17.4. The absorption line we see from the whole star all together, because we can't scan left to right, uh, is actually much wider than it would be if the star were not rotating. Right? So let me repeat. Here is the wide absorption line. Now, what we looked at on the first day of class, those were emission lines. But, you know, and so if we looked at magnesium, we would have seen only this color green or whatever element this is supposed to be. All right. And now over here, here's the non-rotating star. So you see a nice narrow absorption feature. All right. And now, so going back to this one, down here, this is the intensity curve. So an absorption line is gonna be a little bit of a dip in the flux curve of the star. You know, the flux curve, it's, it goes up to a peak and then it trails off into the infrared, you know, dimmer and dimmer and dimmer into the infrared. So, but if you look at small patches of it, you're gonna see dips or bullet holes, I like to call them in the uh, flux curve. And so for, for this one, for a star that's spinning, it's a really wide dip. So it's a big bullet hole. It might be deep, it might not be deep, but, you know, that, but it's gonna be wide. Now compare that to this one over here. This one's gonna be really sharp. It's gonna be a fairly narrow uh, bullet hole in the spectrum of the star, all right? So this is something that we call line broadening. And you have to have a pretty good spectrograph to measure it, but we do it all the time. You know, and we actually do this with all kinds of things, not just with stars. You know, in, in the lab, when we're looking at atoms and molecules in a gas, and we can see absorption lines broadening and stuff like that. Question? You know, every, no, there's not, you can't tell ultra slow rotation from um, zero rotation. 
And because zero rotation, you're still going to get some line broadening because the random motion of the gas of the magnesium atoms in the atmosphere or whatever the substance is, you know, there's going to, th those random motions, just because it's a gas, are going to be going this way and that way, you know, these <coughs> random directions. So you're going to get a little bit of line broadening. So you have the temperature associated, temperature and pressure will produce line broadening and rotation. So you got you to gotta filter all that out. You know, so if you know the temperature, you know the pressure from the color, then you can say, okay, I should get this much line broadening. And then if you, you break it down, you see, well, I'm getting a little more line broadening than that, then I know that I've got rotation. Okay, so, uh, so that's how that works. But yeah, there's a lot to learn on line broadening and, and spectrography. Uh, and as far as like where the blue and the yellow come from, is there a way to know which direction it's spinning? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no way to know which direction it's spinning unless you can resolve the surface. Now we can resolve the surface of a few distant stars like Betelgeuse. It's close enough and big enough on its own that we can make out a few, you know, we've seen that image of Betelgeuse with the hot spots in the infrared, but most stars we can't. So it might be spinning, you know, like a barrel, like this, or it might be spinning like this, and we might not figure it out, unless we can see something else. You know, if we can see, um, you know, planets going like this, then most likely the star's also spinning. You know, so whatever the planets are doing, the star's probably doing pretty close to that. But if you just see that, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, all right, so here's this table again. Now, let me uh, reinforce to you that you can uh, get all these measurements and calculations in and then graph a bunch of stars on graph paper. So, if, for instance, if you graph the mass and the luminosity, Go ahead and make a note of that. Put a star next to each of those in your notes. Mass and luminosity. Um, if you graph those up, um, for instance, with the mass on the horizontal axis and the luminosity, you know, that's usually what we do is put that on the vertical axis. Um, it'll look like this. Okay? Now, eyeball that. Take a look at that. You looking at it? Good. All right. Now that's a bunch of stars um, on a ma what we call a mass luminosity graph. All right, mass on the horizontal, luminosity on the vertical, and look at the the vertical axis. It's powers of ten. All right. So this one's a little bit different. It's not you know one, two, three, four, five. You know it's it's zero point zero zero one, then zero point zero one, then zero point one then one, then 10, then 100, then 1,000, and on up to 100,000. And there are stars that are 100,000 times the luminosity of the SUN. <coughs> All right? And on the horizontal scale, you have powers of 10, but you don't need as many powers of 10 for the mass. Okay? Maybe a few dozen times the mass of the sun, and that seems to be about it. All right? So you might go out somewhere past 10, and somewhere down towards 0 0.1 times the mass of the SUN for the mass. But if you graph it up on that kind of graph paper, uh, then um, you'll get a straight line. My wonderful students, this graph paper is what we're not uh, supposed to be doing in, in Astronomy 2002. This is logarithmic graph paper. But you can just think of it as powers of 10. You know, so many, so many uh, inches for every power of 10. And then the whole numbers are a little trickier to do. You got to use logarithms for that. But uh, this one, yeah, this is. And then one, one. Go ahead and mark down one and one on this scale uh, because that's where the SUN is. All right. Now we're not supposed to be using logarithms, but you can at least look at it. And just remember, it's just powers of 10. It's nothing fancy. You know why it's, people don't like using logarithms? It's really old fashioned. In the old days, before we had calculators, we had to do everything by logarithms, adding up numbers and stuff. And you know, so like back in the days of Sir Isaac Newton to calculate a really big number, you had to use logarithms. It's kind of a pain in the, pain in the you know what. Anyway, so this is a mass luminosity graph. 
And on regular paper, it would have kind of a curve to it. But on um, logarithmic graph paper, powers of 10, nice and straight. And that means something. You know, so here's a side note. And, and no matter what your feelings about logarithms are, you can make this note. That when you plot up a, like, I don't know, 100 stars by mass and luminosity on a piece of graph paper, they're, they're not randomly distributed. That's a pattern. That is not an accident. All right, so make a note. The fact that this is a straight line is a pattern. It is not random. It is not an accident. It means that there's a law of physics behind this. And because there's a law of physics, you know, like Stefan Boltzmann law and a lot of nuclear physics, um, because that's the case, um, you get a nice straight line instead of dots everywhere. Now, there's some things that, where you're going to get dots everywhere. You know, they're not correlated. Uh, but mass and uh, luminosity, yep. Now, um, so here's back to the table. And let's do this one. This is the main one that we want to study, surface temperature and luminosity. Uh, the HR diagram or the color <laughs> luminosity chart. Uh, as some people, or ma color magnitude uh, chart. Uh, and uh, so the HR diagram we're going to talk about, um, and this is one from NASA. We're going to use one from, uh, another one from NASA, actually, for uh, asking some clicker uh, questions. So get your clickers ready. If, you, if your brain is ready and your clicker is ready, you can click on some basic HR diagram questions uh, for this diagram, all right? Now, I'm going to ask you the questions, and you'll see the diagram, so don't worry about losing this diagram. And the main sequence of the HR diagram uh, is uh, nice. Somebody just typed in A. Uh, here's the question. Which part is populated by bluish stars, which part of the main sequence? And this is a basic question. So if I ask anything like this on the final, or excuse me, on the midterm four, you know, you might have to answer multiple choice like this. And let's see if we can do the, um, um, this is the correct answer. No, I wanted to do the oh, touch okay. screen. <gasps> oh, it works you today. Did it. Yay. Yay. What did we do differently? Literally nothing. Yeah, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's just like there's like a dead spot right here. No, like well, like that's, that may be it. That's <laughs> possibly it, or either that or Windows sucks majorly, which that's my theory. Anytime a Windows <laughs> computer doesn't cooperate, it's always Bill Gates' fault. Okay, 15 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Um, yeah, you guys did good. It's uh, the upper left class is O and B. Yeah, those, those are what we would call bluish stars or bluish white. You know, And up in that area, uh, you see stars now. Sirius and Vega are A stars. They're spectral class A zero, so they're a little bit to the right of that, but you know, right in here. So, uh, next question. Another basic, basic, basic question. And you got to know your the layout of your HR diagram if you're going to do any thinking with it. So which ones are intrinsically dimmest of the main sequence? Move, move the screen to the middle. Okay, gotcha. Let's see if it is that. Just in science. Oh. Right, we're going to try it out. No, it won't let me. Move it down this way, see what it does. 
Right. That's Bill Gates. That is Bill Gates. The fact that it won't let you move it. That's so weird. Yeah, it's, it is weird. Okay, uh, fifteen seconds. <coughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Okay, so most of you got this one right. Uh, yeah, these, these guys are orangey red ones down here. All right. Now, uh, next question. How about the S-U-N? Riddle me this. If you've done your reading, you know all the answers here. If you don't do your reading, you're kind of... Maybe flailing a little bit. <coughs> Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one. Ching. Um, yeah, you guys are geniuses. Uh, sun is a G2, approximately. So right there. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of, you know, most of the time, you know, depending on what your data set is, you know, and this is a fairly small data set compared to some... Um, HR diagrams, depending on your data set, sun's usually going to be somewhere in the middle. This is a little bit to the right, but, you know. Um, now, let's use the color luminosity chart to think with. And we're going to go through and look at a few and then kind of get the theory behind the HR diagram. Now, I want you to look at this one. This is the Pleiades. And if you look across the bottom, you'll see that the uh, the the wavelength scale or the surface temperature scale is the B minus V color. That's a color index. But what about that vertical scale? What do you notice about the vertical scale? Look at it carefully. Do you see something that's maybe a little bit out of whack with the vertical? What? What? No, not about the position or the length of it. What do you notice? It's apparent. It's not absolute. It's not the intrinsic. But, go ahead and make a note of that. This, uh, this is all the Pleiades. Now, the Pleiades is a cluster. And because it's a cluster, and it's fairly far away from Earth, we can approximate the distance as about the same for every star in the cluster. Now there'll be a little bit of plus or minus, but it's far enough away that the plus or minus is small enough uh, that we can, they can all have the same distance. So, so what this is like, my wonderful students, is it's like having a bunch of different light bulbs and all of them over there at the Ed building, you know, whatever that is, 300 meters away. Right? And then if you, if you do an HR diagram for the light bulbs over there, the, the apparent luminosity is accurate. The comparison of apparent uh, luminosities, if they're all at the same location, is true. You know, so if everything's over there at the Ed building, the dimmest bulb will have the lowest wattage rating, the lowest absolute luminosity. And the brightest one, if they're all over at the Ed building, it'll have the highest wattage rating, all right? So the, the HR diagram, if you're working with a cluster, it can help you out. You can make some sense out of things. And my wonderful students, this is apparent magnitude, so it's not intrinsic. But this HR diagram can help us um, make some decisions about the Pleiades as a whole. This tells us something about 
uh, the Pleiades as a whole. We'll probably talk about that uh, maybe Thursday or, or next two, two Tuesdays from now after the exam. Now, I want to show you, uh, uh, here's an artist's conception of a satellite called Hipparchos, which was running in the late 80s and early 90s, and it was specifically set up to get spectra and get parallax for as many stars as it could. All right, and it did a really good job. It got about 118,000, the Hipparchos satellite, ultra precise parallax. You know, we can get spectra here from, you know, the top of the mountains out in Hawaii and various places, Arizona, South America and whatnot. Uh, but getting parallax is tougher. This is the HR, doc just look at this. That's, and that's not all 118,000, that's a subset um, of the uh, stars for which parallax and spectral type are known uh, from the, this is what we would call the Hipparchos catalog. This is a, a big part of the Hipparchos catalog. And you can see the main sequence. And you can see the giant stars. This is the giant branch up here. And you can see a few white dwarfs down here, lower left. Yeah, we got some. And the scale here, this is absolute magnitude. And it has a subscript capital V. That's absolute magnitude as measured with the V filter. Okay. And then down here, color index, B minus V. That's the absolute magnitude through the B filter minus the absolute magnitude through the V filter. And that's the color index. All right, so the luminosity, now just to remind you, a deep negative, like negative five at the top, means luminous, if you're talking magnitudes. And a, po a high positive number, like 15, down here, that means dim. So if your vertical scale is magnitudes, you're going to have negatives up top. It's kind of like the reverse psychology. You know, if we, if we had you know, watts per square meter, uh, then the biggest numbers would be at the top and the lowest ones at the bottom. But magnitude is kind of the reverse of that. All right? And the same thing on the, on the horizontal scale. So, you, you know, that's a... And for a side note, let me also um, point this out to you. You see that some of it is actually colored. Now, those are not the color of the stars. The color is assigned in the, it numerically in the, the color index B minus V, all right? The color that you see there, those are false colors, and what those show you are the densest part of the HR diagram, and it's the red. The, the more stars you have, you, you can't graph up 118,000 pixels or even 1,000 pixels and see each individual pixel, all right? So what they do, if there's a lot of pixels on, if there's a lot of stars at the same pixel in this graph, they make it red. And if there's just a few, they make it green. And if there's only one, you know, they make it uh, blue. And you can see out here, the individual stars, those are individual stars out there. They're kind of medium blue. But then down here, there's a lot of stars stacked up here. Right? So they express that with the color red and the color yellow and stuff. There's a little key down here. All right, and this is a power, power of 10 uh, chart as well. So logarithms. Now here's another spacecraft, Gaia. Go ahead and write that one down. First, first spacecraft, Hipparchos. And the second one, Gaia. And Gaia is up there now working hard. Um, and it's doing basically the same thing, except it's better technology. It's about 20 years difference in technology. Um, and... Uh, 20, 25 years better technology. Uh, so it's, we figure it's going to get a, over a million stars in its catalog. And it, it doesn't have them all yet, but it's going to get the, the uh, red shifts. It's going to get spectral type. It's going to get parallax for a bunch of stars. Okay. And um, here's the, whoa, here's a few of them. And again, this one's, 
uh, color coded for intensity or for population. So this, again, this is the, this is the highly populated part of the HR diagram. So these are, and you can see, we got a lot of, this seems to be like a nugget up here of giant stars. A lot of giant stars. Not as many as here, the center of the HR diagram, but still pretty good. Um, now, uh, on this one, for, for Gaia, I want you to look at this horizontal scale. Absolute V subscript T magnitude. And I can't remember what the capital T means. But it's a, it's a V, it's a V uh, filter magnitude. Down here, though, we have color index, J minus K. And there's something significant about this that I want to... So add this to your notes. Uh, why is the color index for Gaia not B minus V? That's the one that Hipparchos used, and a lot of astronomers use B minus V. Why is this one J minus K? Well... Let's think. The color system that we talked about last time, U, B, V, R, I. Okay, U is ultraviolet. Roy G. Biv was in V, no. V, U, B, V, B, V, R. B, V, R, that was the Roy G. Biv part, okay? And then the I, that was infrared. Now, J and K are deeper in the infrared. So what this is doing, my wonderful students, this is not really a color that we could see, but you could see, you know, it's a, it's a color, you know, it's, a, it's an infrared color index. All right, so make a note of that. Gaia is looking at hard at ultraviolet, excuse me, at infrared. Gaia is looking hard at the infrared. And you may be saying to yourself, Dr. B, so what? I'm tired of all this infrared situation. But my answer to you is, oh no. Because Gaia is looking deep, deep, deep into our halfway across the galaxy and more. It is, and you can only do that with infrared. You cannot do it with visible. And remember when I talked about the big galactic black hole, SGR A star, Sagittarius A star, and we can only see it mainly in the, ultra, in the in, infrared? Yeah, it's because there's so much gas and dust between us and the center that we can't really make out a lot of visible, but by golly, we can see pretty good in the infrared. And that's what Gay is doing. And so look at this diagram. The reach of Gaia is halfway across our galaxy. And it is, so it's got a lot of work to do, my friends. Uh, and so Gaia's catalog, oh my goodness. It is going to be extremely valuable. People will be uh, mining the data from that. Might even find aliens uh, from the Gaia catalog. You know that? And I'll bet that by the time you guys um, are old and gray and walking around with a cane and, and saying, yeah, when I was your age 40 years ago, all that kind of corny stuff, uh, they'll still be digging through this stuff from Gaia. It's, that's how much data they're going to have. It's going to be pretty rich. All right, let's get back. So, so looking at HR diagrams is really good, and we're, doing, we're trying to do it a good job of it and get as much as we can. Now, main sequence, let's repeat the, the, the strategy. Um, you, you take your stars and most of them will be on the main sequence. Um, and so you map it out, you know, either the color or the, or the, um, you know, the temperature, B minus V, if you want. Um, and then you map out luminosity, you know, absolute magnitude, uh, total bolometric magnitude, that's a fancy term. Uh, or you can map it out just in terms of the multiples of the luminosity of the sun, that's what this is, in powers of 10. And here's the other reason that the Gaia instrument is looking hard into the infrared. 
if you have a star like 51 Pegasi, remember we saw 51 Pegasi? It had that big disk, and we could see a couple planets clearing the protostellar disk. There's a very young star system. Now, the star was already born. That star was, is a star. But not too long ago, the 51 Pegasi system was not very bright. That central object was not bright at all. 51 Pegasi, the star. Uh, it mostly shone in the infrared. So when you have gravity, when the star is forming, it's gravitationally compressing and heating through gravitational compression before the core is starting to fuse hydrogen. You're just getting, it's going to be, it's not even going to be red. It's going to be bright in the infrared though, fairly bright, just as you're fairly bright in the infrared. Uh, so stuff that is not yet a star, stuff that has not started fusing hydrogen is going to be way down there um, below the stage, below the surface of the stage. It'll be down and to the right on the HR diagram. It'll be way down there. Now, Gay is trying to find stuff down there. Gay is trying to find stuff in the red end of the HR diagram because we think there's a lot that we haven't seen. Gay is trying to find them. Uh, but those stars, before they form, they're not going to show up. So once the core of a star, you know, it compresses and compresses and compresses and gets hotter and hotter, its still, surface is still infrared, surface is still infrared until the day that it starts to nuclear react in the core. And then a few years after that, all that heat energy gets to the surface and it starts to really glow. It'll jump onto, bam, onto the main sequence. All right, so that's the transition uh, that we are pretty sure happens. So there's a lot of stuff that we can't see yet, uh, except maybe in the infrared. But as soon as, we, as soon as they start chain reacting hydrogen into helium in the core, bam, right onto the main sequence. All right, so that's what, and my wonderful students, that's what we consider the birth of a star. You know, before that, it, you know, it's just like a little baby. You know, a little baby's in there, but we don't say it's born until he comes out and he starts breathing and stuff. Same thing with a star. We don't consider it born until it, start, until it gets onto the main sequence and starts fusing hydrogen. Okay? Now, uh, the blue high-mass main sequence stars are up here. The surface is blue. They're very H-O-T at the surface and in the center as well. And they're up there at the upper end, the luminous end, the high intrinsic luminosity end of the main sequence. By the same token, the dim red stars, the pokey ones, of which there's a ton, they're down here at the right lower end. All right? And then, of course, the sun's kind of here in the middle of it all. all right? Somewhere in the yellowy green stars. And as you can, uh, hopefully you can appreciate now that we've looked at, I don't know, we've looked at about four different um, main sequence, four different HR diagrams. They all look slightly different depending on, you know, what kind of scale you use. Is it powers of 10 or is it, you know, is it, is it magnitude? Is it color index? You know, what are you using? They'll look, but you'll still, you still always get from lower right to upper left for the main sequence. It might have a wiggle or so or it might have a slightly different shape curve, but it'll still go uh, in that direction. Here's another picture of it. Now, where this black, a lot of time, I don't like this one. This one's from the textbook. It, but it's, I mean, it's all right, I guess. It's got the colors in the background for the colors of the stars, so. But, and I don't really like the color because, you know, it makes the sun look yellow, but the, the sun is more yellowy green. They didn't consult me, so. But anyways, this is, you know, a lot of times you'll see an HR diagram with s some stars identified. And many semesters, I, at this point of the semester, now we're not going to do it this semester because of the hurricanes and stuff, but I give a, a homework assignment for students to make their own HR diagram with the SUN and a few other stars in there on graph paper by hand. 
as a nice exercise. Um, we're not going to do it this year, but it's not that hard. Uh, and this was chapter 18.4, figure three. Uh, what I want to talk about now is the giant branch. We've talked about the main sequence. And you guys, we could talk for a year about the main sequence and never get done. It's just, it's inexhaustible. But let's dip over to the giant branch, okay? And the giant branch is this one over here to the upper right. And the question is, okay, how can a star be at once cool on the surface meaning each square meter of the star does not uh, put out all that much energy. I mean, that's what it means to be cool. And yet it's very luminous. So we know that something that's red is putting out some watts per square meter, but not as many as something that's blue. And something that's blue, hot, is putting out more. All right, so why is there anything that's red that's also luminous? Well, the only way for this to, if so, this group over here, the only way for that thing to, do, to, to work is for it to have a lot of square meters. Let me repeat that, and you can jot it down. It's not in the notes. It's not in the PowerPoint. It's not on the keynote. The only way for this to happen is for, for the star to have a lot of square meters on the surface. Or if you got, it, so you're, you're, every square meter is kind of pokey because it's red. All right, that's, you know, everybody knows that. But if you got a lot of them, you're still going to send out a lot of light. All right, so it's a big red surface. And so that's why we know just looking, it's kind of cool. Just looking at the HR diagram, you know that those stars up there are big. All right? Those are big ones, those red giants. These stars, here's another pull quote from uh, chapter 18, section 4. These stars must be giants or super giants. Um, the stars of huge diameter that we discussed earlier, actually, the textbook discussed earlier. And so, now I'm going to ask you another clicker question in just a second. Um, and here's, the, here's what I want to communicate to you what makes the red giant stars you know so markedly on the hr diagram anyways different from the main sequence you know it's it's not a, just kind of a random oh I'll just go you know it's not like you know you close your eyes and you and you pick a point on the graph paper it's not it's not random that ain't random that's a pattern you know what's the why is there a pattern? Is there some new law of physics in there? So the question, the, the, the answer to that question is, yeah, there's some law of physics that's working, you know, some other law of physics maybe that's dominating in red giants that doesn't really dominate in the main sequence, all right? And the same thing works for white dwarf stars as well. Now, there's an interesting analogy in chapter 18.4. And when I first read it, uh, the other day, I thought, this is, this is kind of hokey. You know, they take a survey of uh, humans ages eight, 6 to 18 uh, during a 24-hour period at random times, and they find that most of them are in school. You know, the, the survey is, where are you? And, the student, and whoever it is answers the phone. You know, the, the, the majority is, I'm at school. And some of them are, I'm eating breakfast. Some of them are, I'm in bed. Get off my phone or whatever. You know, but the, the majority in this little analogy that they have, they say, well, they're at school. So that tells you that a good fraction of the time, um, the, they, you know, students spend their time at school. All right, so it's a good analogy to look at. Um, and we're going to try to make sense of it in just a second. But I have a question for you about white dwarf stars. We just talked about red giants. Let's talk about um, white dwarf stars. Here's a question for you. Read carefully. Why do we even call it dwarf? I mean, dwarf means little. Why is that? Boy, the room just went quiet. Did you hear that? Everybody's thinking. Good. I got you right where I want you. You're thinking. 
So definitely talk it over with your neighbor for a second. Does their reasoning match with yours? Can they... If you have a neighbor, if you're sitting by yourself, you know, we can, we can set up a program, you know, a GoFundMe account to, you know, rent a neighbor to sit next to you, pay somebody to sit next to you and lecture. I'm looking at somebody he doesn't even know. <laughs> it's all right. Anyway, discuss with your neighbors how we doing here, 151. Okay, 30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Come on. Answer. I know 20 of you didn't just leave while I was looking. There we go. That's better. All right. Zero. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, the surface is hot, but they don't produce much light. And why is that? Fewer square meters. So the radius is smaller. Four pi r squared. That's the area of a sphere. What's... Well, and hey, you guys, you know what this tells? If, if, you, if you actually work out all the calculus and the trig and everything, you know what this tells us? That a white dwarf star is about the size of Earth. So that white dwarf star that we can see orbiting Sirius A, the reason it's hard to see is it's small. Thomas. Yeah, neutron stars aren't even on it because neutron stars are not luminous in the normal sense. They're not going to produce, the surface of a neutron star is not going to be luminous. They'll have a, like, a, they'll cause mayhem around it. So we sometimes pick them up on x-rays or even radio frequency because they have a strong magnetic field. But um, they're going to be down here. You know, they're going to be bright and to the left, past the blues, into the inf- ultraviolet and into the x-rays. You know, and, but they're not going to be very bright, so it's going to be way down as well. So, yeah, you could probably put a few neutron stars in there, but, you know, they're so, they're so radically different, you, you know, they you wouldn't really normally want to do that. So here's our question, you know, that we want to try to tackle. Um, why does the HR diagram stack up this way? You know, we got these patterns, right? It's not random. It's not, you know, some guy in the, you know, up in the observatory just closing his eyes and putting a, dot, a bunch of dots at random. Oh, yeah, here's my pattern. No, it's not. It's, it's a pattern. And here's, here's the, what we do, you know. It's, you know, on average, 90% of all stars are located on the main sequence. And so what we want to do is identify some activity or some law of physics, is really what that means, or life stage with the main sequence. And then it follows that stars must spend 90% of their lives in that activity or life stage. So what we do is try to make computer models. So we make a theoretical model. You know, so all the guys out at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, they get together and they think, all right, we know about hydrogen fusion from nuclear weapons. What would we do with a star that had a certain pressure and temperature, so many kilograms of hydrogen in such and such a space, you know, so many hundred thousand kilometers, uh, what would the reaction rate be? You know, what would the reactions be? You know, how many... How many hydrogens would be turned into deuterium? How many deuteriums would be turned into helium? You know, and so they work all that stuff out. And so what they find is that, as it says here, our computer models of how stars evolve over time show us that a typical star, in other words, lots of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, will spend about 90% of its life fusing the abundant hydrogen in its core. It's a helium. 
So we know that because we, we have an idea, you know, e equals mc squared and all that, all the quantum mechanics that goes with that. Uh, we can think, all right, if I have so much, if I have the mass of the sun, 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, and most of it hydrogen, you know, at what depth will it be hot enough to start a nuclear fusion reaction? Okay, at what depth, and how much mass is in that core at that depth or below that depth? So how long will it take to, to um, exhaust that and turn it into helium? And so they worked it out, and it turns out that when you um, take different amounts of hydrogen and make them into a star, you know, in your model, a self-gravitating mass of hydrogen, um, it'll form a main sequence. Let me repeat that. Our models show that different masses of hydrogen, self-gravitating and fusing hydrogen, will form a main sequence. The brightest ones will be bigger. The dimmer ones will be smaller. And it will fill this pattern if you, if you, if you organize your data according to color and luminosity. So the conclusion is everything on the main sequence is burning, is fusing hydrogen. You know, the proton-proton chain. And by the same token, by similar reasoning, we know that there has to be some other law of physics cooking up there in the giant branch. And what is it? Well, to start with, it's helium fusion. When your core is cooked up a lot of helium, you still got a little bit of hydrogen, but you got a lot of helium too, um, you're going to start to contract, get hotter, and start fusing helium. A different reaction completely. So all your physics changes. You know, your equilibrium conditions. You know, how big does a star have to be before the inward gravitational pressure bounces the outward thermal pressure forces? Okay? And all that changes if the reactions change. And down here, the white dwarfs, zip, zap. They're not fusing anymore at all. You know, it's like a, a cinder left over. It's still hot. But, you know, it can't dissipate heat uh, very efficiently because it's not surrounded by conducting material. You know, so if you want to dissipate heat, uh, you, um, you know, you connect it to a conducting material. Right? So, so when you want to transport heat from your burner uh, into the water, you put it inside a metal cook pot. You know, you don't put it inside of a, uh, an insulated cook pot. You know, it's you know, insulated with air or styrofoam or something. You know, you wouldn't do that. You could, but why would you want to? All right, so you put it, so, but stars, there's no, there's no uh, conducting material. It's just empty space, pretty much. So they lose energy by radiation, but it's pretty slow. So the white dwarves, yeah, no fusion down there. So here's the conclusion. Astrophysicists, this is actually from chapter 18. And you know, I was telling a student after class, morning lecture, how do I study better to, to get a better grade on the exams? And I told her, let my lecture notes be the lead. If you see me refer to something in the textbook, go to that section and read. Read that paragraph and maybe the one above it and the diagram below it. All right, so here's a quote. I've been really working hard to give you guys quotes and tell you what chapter they're from. Astrophysicists have been able to show that the structure of stars that are in equilibrium, that's dynamic, thermodynamic and gravitational equilibrium, and derive all their energy from nuclear fusion is completely and uniquely determined by just two quantities. The total mass, how much have you got? And then how much of it is hydrogen and how much of it is helium? You know, so the fancy word for that is chemical composition. But most stars are going to be starting with mostly hydrogen and a little bit of helium. But you know, the red giants and stuff, they're up there fusing silicon. They're fusing carbon and magnesium and stuff, all different 
elements all the way up to uh, number 26, iron. In the periodic table, they'll fuse, and they'll create some iron nuclei. And we'll talk about that after the exam. But the total mass, underline that one, in the, in the equations of equilibrium, the key factor that determines where you live on the main sequence is the mass. That's it. That's the star's DNA. And so knowing the star's mass allows you to predict, you know, from a protostellar disk that's hot in the infrared, if you know what its mass is, and I, I bet there's guys that try to figure out the mass of the central object in a protostellar disk. You know, based on infrared measurements. Um, yeah, if you know the mass, you know where it's going to land as soon as it does start nuking hydrogen into helium. All right? If you see something like 51 pegasi before it lights up, you can, if you can estimate the mass, you know where it's going to land on the main sequence. Here's a diagram. This is one uh, from David Jeffries at a, a University of Las Vegas. And everywhere along the... Um, the, uh, uh, so this is not really a main sequence scatter plot. It's just kind of a, kind of a schematic or a cartoon as he, as he terms it. Um, everywhere along the main sequence, stuff is fusing hydrogen. All right, so that's good. But now the star's mass puts it on a specific location. All right, so up here, if you have 23 times the mass of the sun, you're way up there in the upper left. All right, you're up there past Sirius and Vega. You're up there in the really bright stuff, 23 times the mass of the SUN. Similarly, uh, two times the mass of the SUN. You're down towards the middle. You're in the A's, maybe. All right. And if your mass is kind of pokey, you're just, and, you know, just a little bit more modest, like over here, 0 0.51, yeah, you're going to be down here in the M's and the K's. Right? So it's, you know, and, and you can look these up. You know, so what this is, a, it's, a, it's a main sequence that's been calibrated by mass. So the, the mass up at the top is 23, and then, all right, now where's 2.0? And then you lo locate that on the main sequence. And then where's, where's, zero, where's 0 0.5? And they locate that. And what we got is 0 0.51 here. And they locate that. They put a dot. Okay, so this is the theoretical location uh, where those stars will be. So that's, that's how the DNA works. So the most massive stars, um, this is why it works this way. They're more massive. Um, they have more gravity. The strength of gravity is stronger. Um, and so they can compress their centers to a greater degree. And therefore, the nuclear reactions, it's hotter inside the core. So they're going to be going to town. And these stars up here, what we're going to find out after the exam, they're really bright. 23 times the mass of the sun, their core is really cooking. And because that is true, they don't live very long. Very short lifetimes before they start straying off to the giant branch and the super giant branch. They're going to cook. But down here, you know, here's the sun at one. You know, one times the mass of the sun. One times the luminosity of the sun. A G2. Uh, billions of years. You know. But these guys up here, oh man. Not many millions of years, if that. All right. So as the star consumes its core hydrogen, converting it to helium, the source of energy changes. As I said, you know, you're going to have the exotic reactions, you know, turning helium into, you know, silicon. You know, there's all kinds of chain reactions, you know. And so you have, for instance, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle, right? And there's, you know, there's all, all kinds of nuclear reactions that produce silicon nuclei, sodium, calcium, and you know, all the elements up to 26, up to iron on the periodic table in the center of a star. And the, the reason the source of energy changes 
is because, you know, you, you've, you've fused. You know, you're using this fuel and you're changing it into something else. So that's changing the composition. You're changing hydrogen into helium. Now, when we, when we make a batch of bread at home, you know, the flour doesn't change into uh, butter, uh, but in a star it does. You know, the, he, the hydrogen uh, converts into helium, okay? And so it's, it's pretty cool. But the basic idea is that when that um, hydrogen is done fusing in the core, you lose equilibrium. You, you, you break equilibrium, and now you're going to start some other chemical pro, uh, nuclear process, not chemical, but nuclear process, and it's going to be uh, helium fusion and all the exotic fusion reactions that we'll talk about next week. All right, so, uh, so the HR diagram. Now, we've been thinking, and I've been giving you some of the theory underneath it. The main item of theory is mass is the DNA of a star. It tells you where on the main sequence it lands, how long it's going to be there, how bright it's going to be, even what color it's going to be when you look at it through a telescope. All kind of stuff. Right? So it's like the DNA. And my comments to you, uh, looks like we'll dismiss a few minutes early. Um, for exam four, you know how I said, don't leave yet. I'm giving you the key. The key in exam three was McKeegan. It brought it all together. For exam four, it's the HR diagram. That brings it all together. All right, so remember that. And I'll see you next week on Tuesday. Oh, by the way, uh, I'll have office hours tomorrow in my office, 9.30 to 11. So in case you missed it yesterday, you can come see me. Good. So my question is, does hydrogen, is hydrogen consumed at constant? Like I know if there's more consumption. Yeah, I don't know, man. My guess is no, it's not a constant rate because, but it's, it's going to be pretty constant because just think of the SUN, such a small fraction is converted into into energy so you're not really changing the you know like the analogy i said you're not changing the the flour into butter very quickly so the proportions aren't changing in the in the sun but now in these these blue stars at the upper left yeah it's 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 happening pretty fast so for those stars the rates probably change very quickly so if it's pretty specific and you know the mass of a star, can you like time when it's going to move off of the main sequence? You can. Yeah, you can, you can, yeah, within a few million years. Yeah, yeah, just pretty accurate, within a few million years. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, question. Do we have to know how to calculate the magnitude using the magnitude equation? Do we have to know how to use that? That's logarithms and stuff, isn't it? Yeah. No. What we, what's the, what's the, Astronomy 2002 law for logarithms. Just say no. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. All right. Don't flip that. All right. I can fill that out right now. Anybody else have a, do you have one of these? Let me, I'll, I'll fill it out right now. Get, get my one out. Um, done? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, dismount the, the USB chip. It's been and weird. Give me your mic. Oh. There you go. And actually, I'm recording all this. <laughs> Let me get my uh, Dr. B up to the usual tricks. If I can find my cursor. There we go.